Think Tank with me, Steve Adubato, is brought to you by these public spirited organizations. MD Advantage Insurance Company. NJM Insurance Group, serving New Jersey's drivers, homeowners, and business owners for more than 100 years. Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey. The Russell Berry Foundation, making a difference. The Turrell Fund, supporting right from the start NJ. The Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. Gibbons PC. With 200 attorneys, Gibbons is a full-service law firm focused on handling major matters for mid-market companies and mid-market matters for Fortune 500 companies. Wells Fargo. And by Fedway Associates, Inc. Promotional support provided by Meadowlands Chamber. Building connections, driving business growth. And by NJ Biz, providing business news for New Jersey for more than 30 years, online, in print, and in person. Online at njbiz.com. Welcome to Think Tank, the podcast. I'm Steve Adubato. The program you're about to see was taped earlier this year. Clearly, so much has changed since then, and unfortunately, a lot of uncertainty and fear remain. But the content in this Think Tank podcast and the issues explored will still matter once we get through these very difficult times together. Most importantly, we hope and pray that you and your family are safe. So without further ado, Think Tank, the podcast. I want to uh, thank our underwriters who make this possible, MD Advantage Insurance Company, Horizon Blue Cross and Blue Shield, New Jersey, NJM Insurance Group, and Russell Berry Foundation. It is my honor and pleasure to introduce Dr. John Johnson, uh, PhD, Assistant Professor, St. Peter's University. How are you doing, doctor? Doing well. Thank you for having me. We had a very important conversation. Actually, it's Dr. Johnson who's setting up the Dr. Johnson conversation that we had on, on Think Tank. We talked about white supremacy. We talked about race relations. And one of the things I want to do in setting this up is ask you this. Why has it been so hard for us, so many, to have a real, genuine, honest conversation about race in America, particularly between folks who are not of the same race? There's so much invested in white supremacy and race relations, uh, the way they are now. Uh, people benefit from the disparities that we see in society. And uh, I think it's hard to get people to talk and argue against some of their own best interests. Um, while at the core of who we are, you know, Thomas Jefferson said uh, that we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. Uh, oftentimes, white supremacy puts out information that we can call disinformation mm -hmm. that I think in a lot of ways um, makes it seem as though we are rewarding people that don't deserve those rewards. But if you really look at the long sweep of history, uh, we've been giving out rewards to a number of people. Uh, invariably, they haven't been to African-Americans and other peoples of color. Uh, there is a thing called white privilege, and uh, unfortunately, it's uh, tainted the conversation. But, you know, there's, there's more to it. Well... There's so much to it than that, and you'll see in this conversation I had with, with Dr. Johnson. By the way, I want to thank the folks, Gene Kronaka and the others at St. Peter's University for allowing the professor to join with us. Gene is the president over there. Uh, I'm born and raised in Newark, New Jersey, Brick City, if you will. I was a little kid. I remember the Newark riot slash rebellion, 1967. Changed that city forever. Your research. Talk about it. Well, I look closely at uh, what forces led to the what we would call underdevelopment of Newark. Uh, we often think of the 67 Rebellion as the, the point at which Newark goes into decline, but we actually go back to the 1920s. Uh, back at that time, interestingly enough, uh, when you had, say, I guess maybe some of your forebears uh, who were immigrating to the United States, uh, you have policies that cut off the possibility for them to come here, the 1924 Immigration Act. My grandfather came here in 1919 from Naples, Italy. Wow, he made it just in time because after 1924, uh, Italians, Jews, and other Eastern and Southern Europeans weren't allowed to the country because it was believed that they would taint uh, white Anglo-Saxon Protestant uh, stock. I'm sorry, are we talking about 2020? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> no, but here's the rub. But, 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 but there is, it's not that dissimilar. Not that dissimilar, very similar. Uh, the idea that race transmits through blood uh, goes back to uh, the late 19, late 1800s, uh, and it manifests in policy. Uh, we see the ways in which, uh, and after that, you had to have a lot of African Americans come to places like Newark to take up those jobs that those immigrants were initially uh, taking. Uh, but the city was already in decline because a lot of the city fathers were using the, the city funds and tax funds to uh, benefit their businesses, but not the residents. Interesting. And that book... 
coming out? Uh, it is about three years away. I'm still in the research phases right now. I'm doing the last part, actually looking at the Week Wake section uh, and what happens in Week Wake after it becomes a majority black community. Wow. Uh, one of the things that we tend to forget is that uh, Interstate 78, which was uh, built through the Week Wake section, displaced a lot of African Americans and Jews, but it connected the suburbs to downtown Newark. You know, it's interesting living in the other end of the city, in the north ward of the city, Route 280. Exactly. I, I, I remember how many families moved out of our neighborhood soon after 280 was built. Our family did not, our family stayed, and my parents still there in the city. But it's interesting how federal policy regarding highway construction for development and expansion made it a lot easier for certain folks to move. They were disproportionately white, and it changed the, neighbor, na the nature of those communities. Uh, Dr. Johnson, stay with us, because right after the second interview on Think Tank, the podcast, I'm going to offer, get your perspective as well. This is Think Tank, the podcast. I'm Steve Adubato. That is Dr. Johnson. Let's check out this compelling conversation with the good doctor in studio. Hi, I'm Cecilia Zalkin. It costs much more to care for an infant than for an older child, and many New Jersey child care centers don't have the funding they need. Because of this, many children in New Jersey don't have their basic needs met. Right from the start, NJ is dedicated to supporting this vulnerable population, children from birth to age three. We know that the early years are the most critical, and we believe that every child deserves a bright beginning and a healthy future. Hi, I'm Steve Adubato. This is Think Tank. We are honored to be once again joined by Dr. John Johnson who's Assistant Professor of History at St. Peter's University. Good to see you, Doctor. Nice to meet you. You spent a fair amount of time thinking about writing about researching and a book coming up dealing with racism, particularly in the city of Newark, New Jersey. But the larger question of, dare I say, white supremacy, how bad is the problem in our nation and are we dealing with it directly enough? In recent years, it has escalated significantly. Um, it's safe to say that uh, I'll just say it, I'll put it out there. The current administration in a lot of ways has... The uh, Trump administration. The Trump administration has fomented uh, and really used a lot of these longstanding racialist ideas that have been around for a while, uh, but have really been the centerpiece of their uh, administration. Um, mm. It didn't necessarily begin with Trump. I mean, these ideas have been around for a very long time. What are they? Um, I mean, if we, if we can just step back real quick and I think just define what white supremacy is, I think that's a great place to start. Um, it is the ideas, the beliefs, but also the policies and the procedures that uh, are reflective of and reinforce ideas that suggest that non-white people are inferior to white people. Um, whether we're talking about Jim Crow segregation in the South, we're talking about the institution of slavery, um, whether we're talking about uh, the border policies uh, of using uh, camps or prisons to keep people who are seeking freedom, uh, fleeing for their lives and seeking freedom and safety in the United people States. people coming from certain kind of countries, asshole countries. Mm -hmm. Was that racist at the core? Um, I think it's important to note that when we talk about those folks and where they're coming from, these asshole countries, uh, let's look at, say, parts of Central America. A number of these people, the estimates, I believe, are 85 to 90 percent of them are Catholic. Yet we don't think about them as Christians who are fleeing to seek freedom in the United States. We call them or we refer to them in any number of ways except for their identity that as people in the United States, we often hold Christianity in high regard, right? As a matter of fact, we believe in religious freedoms. Uh, we support Christian peoples in their efforts to seek freedom and to practice their religion. And yet and still you have these people that are coming to the country who are dealing with trying circumstances, uh, folks from El Salvador, uh, Mexico, um, all these countries in Central America who are seeking freedoms and being denied because of their race. Because of the race. Respectfully, help me understand this. Do you separate the issues of the complex issues of immigration from the historical American history of racism, including slavery, Jim Crow, the inability to vote legally in this country? segregation, et cetera, et cetera. Do you separate the two? Because they sound like two different issues. I want to separate the two. They emerge from similar, uh, they, are, they emerge from the begin uh, same beginnings. I mean, we have to go back to look at the early part of the modern era when uh, European nations began to explore parts of the Americas, parts of Africa, and parts of Asia. Uh, and as um, these Portuguese, the Spanish began to encounter these people that were very much different from them. They weren't Christian. 
Uh, some of them weren't to be sure. I mean, in Africa, there were various uh, religious practices, including Islam and Christianity. But when they got to the Americas, they encountered people that are very much different from them. Uh, different in skin tone, different in religion, different in language. And from that, a system of beliefs began to emerge. Part of that was also uh, used to justify um, exploiting the resources in the Americas. Okay, uh, respectfully, here's, here's my challenge here. Mm -hmm. The history matters. Mm -hmm. But for a lot of folks watching right now, mm -hmm. I can tell you what I think many are thinking. What does that? What does that have to do with today? Oh, it has everything to do with well, today. Well, then br bring, it, bring it clear to us right now, this administration, this country, our country, at this time, as it relates to racism and white supremacy, that history matters. Mm -hmm. And your book, I'm sure, will break it down in more detail when it's published. Bring it up to date. Well, when we look at white supremacy, I think it's used as a means of, uh, of, of obscuring the truth. I would even call it a Ponzi scheme, in that people tend to believe that whiteness will provide them any number of benefits, and to a certain extent it does. Right? Um, they may uh, get hired for a job over somebody who is not white. They may, believe, they may actually get access to a suburban community with better amenities than an urban community. But in the long run, it's not about their productivity as much as those that are controlling the levers of power for them to maintain power. White supremacy is a means of causing division. Again, if you look at the history of the United States, when we begin to see racialized differences is when slavery becomes a highly profitable uh, institution. And that's when we, we begin to see the creation of laws that begin to separate white from black. Uh, the freedoms of African Americans, for the most part, was similar to indentured servants in the 1600s. Uh, black individuals could own property. And in some cases, they could own slaves. But laws were created to sow division and, and to shrink the freedoms of African Americans. But respectfully, again, mm -hmm. you got to, for our audience, the history matters. Mm -hmm. But there are some who are thinking Barack Obama was president of the United States. How much difference does that make in the context of the issues you are raising around white supremacy and racism, institutionalized. Mm -hmm. Well, I think what ends up happening is that institutional racism is highly profitable. Uh, one of the- Even today? Even today. How so? One example. Um, we look at the, as much as the United States is moving towards reforming the criminal justice system, we see federal contracts going to build these, uh, these camps at the border. Um, white supremacy is very uh, profitable in the sense that it allows for say, policies that help uh, funnel money to the wealthy at the expense of things that can benefit the larger masses of American people. I mean, if you think about the debates that we have around Social Security and health care, we often think about them, and it's framed as something that is given to, these are free things given to people that don't necessarily deserve them. But if you go to Appalachia, if you go to, say, Salem County, if you go to certain parts of western New Jersey where white folks are struggling just as much as black folks, That's right. these are things that everyone could benefit from, yet, we always come back around, I mean, not to say we, those that are in power always come back around to, uh, well, we have to keep these people from taking things from us. I mean, most recently, it was it yesterday? Uh, the As Trump, we do this program, go ahead. Yeah, the Trump administration um, uh, just instituted policies that essentially don't allow immigrants to uh, get federal benefits that could help them become better, more, uh, more productive citizens. Underlying that is this idea that those people don't deserve those uh, those benefits. One action that we need to take that will help us move in the right direction is? Um, I think we have to have more conversations like this. And if we, say, have conversations around white supremacy and racism, the conversation just can't end there. We have to continue to explore our mutual uh, obligations to one another. Um, the university that I teach at, it's uh, founded on Jesuit principles. And it's the idea of uh, one finding God in everything and caring for the entire person. And despite all of the differences that are very much put in the forefront, you know, when we address issues of white supremacy, we have to talk about the ways in which uh, people are marginalized and oppressed. At the same time, we have to begin to recognize the commonalities that we all share. I mean, it, it's one of the more interesting things. Is Two much, seconds, go ahead. Uh, and and it, it's, it's amazing that um, African Americans, as much as we've been marginalized and oppressed in this country, we've also created uh, the culture uh, that not only people in the United States, but people the world over have embraced. Mm. Uh, if anything, we've created the soundtrack to this country, rock and roll, that all peoples can embrace. And what's interesting is that uh, white artists constantly or fairly consistently give credit to those blues artists that created music that was steeped, uh, that came out of our oppression. We've been able to find joy in those things that have uh, oppressed us.
Professor uh, John Johnson, Assistant uh, Professor of History at St. Peter's University, one of the many institutions of higher learning we partner with. Next time you come back, let's talk about how divided we are in terms of race and some of the things we need to do to improve race relations in the nation. Thank you for joining us on Think Tank. Thank you. I'm Steve Adubato. We'll be right back. NJM Insurance Company has been serving New Jersey policyholders for more than 100 years. But just who are NJM's policyholders? They're the men and women who teach our children, the public sector employees who maintain our infrastructure, the workers who craft our manufactured goods, and New Jersey's next generation of leaders, the people who make our state a great place to call home. NJM, we've got New Jersey covered. Think Tank with me, Steve Adubato, is brought to you by these public-spirited organizations. MD Advantage Insurance Company, NJM Insurance Group, Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, the Russell Berry Foundation, the Turrell Fund, supporting right from the start NJ, the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, Gibbons PC, Wells Fargo, and by Bedway Associates, Inc. Promotional support provided by Meadowlands Chamber and by NJ Biz. Transportation provided by Airbrook Limousine, serving the metropolitan New York, New Jersey area. Welcome to Think Tank, the podcast. I'm Steve Adubato. I'm honored to be joined in studio by Dr. John Johnson, who is Assistant Professor of History at St. Peter U University. I want to thank you for joining us earlier for that compelling conversation. Let's set up this conversation you're about to see with another extraordinary young leader, A. Dorian Murray Thomas, founder of She Wins, Inc. She lost her dad to gun violence at seven years of age growing up in Brick City, Newark, New Jersey. She's a fighter. She organized this great organization called She Wins. She matters because? She matters because she addresses a problem that is endemic to a lot of our cities and uh, really all over the country now violence. with the escalation of gun violence in right. schools. Uh, this is one of those things that I don't think goes into uh, a national test standards. Like how do you address the trauma of gun violence? And so she's speaking to the particular experiences of young black kids in Newark uh, who, uh, particularly young girls, who have experienced uh, this kind of trauma. Uh, but it is a national problem, and I think she's on to something in terms of uh, empowering students to be able to cope with it. It seems as though uh, national leadership is a little resistant to address those matters, uh, and so it really falls upon um, the citizens, in this case, this young woman, uh, this outstanding young woman who is doing the work to ensure that students have the, the tools necessary uh, to cope with gun violence. So interesting as you listen to a Dorian Thomas Murray, uh, Murray Thomas, excuse me. We're students of leadership here. We have our program that you see earlier here on News 12 Plus, Lessons in Leadership. She is an example of an extraordinary leader. Someone who sees a problem and talks about seeing it. She experienced that seven years of age. She loses her dad to gun violence. She decides to make a difference. She decides to be um, part of the solution. We need more of that. That is not the entire answer. There are a whole bunch of laws that need to be changed and attitudes that need to be changed, societal uh, views of urban America. But She Wins is the neighbor, na name of the organization that uh, Adorian created and uh, a very co compelling conversation with a very powerful young leader. Check it out. <laughs> You start generations and generations of people going to college, you know, becoming the lawyer, doctors, whatever it is you want to do, you start generations of them. Um, well, Dorian's great, and, like, she teaches us more than, like, just, like, inside school things, like, how to make friends. Like, she also teaches us about, like, economic problems and, like, things that's going around in the world. I learned self-confidence, time management, and how to react in certain situations. They're basically like big sisters who like help you and like teach you and like lead you and guide you. It's honestly a good experience because you get to see um, those that you're mentoring grow into becoming a leader just like you. You saw the video and here she is, the leader right here, a Dorian Murray Thomas, founder. She Wins Incorporated, a terrific organization. We met you at the Rustbury Awards for Making a Difference. You were recognized with your colleagues. Tell folks what She Wins is all about. 
So thank you, Steve. Uh, she Wins is a leadership and social action organization for middle and high school girls based in my hometown of Newark, uh, particularly those Nine affected two. by violence. Always, always. You got to represent right. the Brick City. Brick City. Uh huh. But you know it well, and you know yeah. it in a way that, um, unfortunately, you'd rather have never have known it this way. When you talk about violence and young girls affected mm -hmm. by violence, this isn't some philosophical or th theoretical thing for you, it's real. So when I was seven years old, my father was gunned down just two blocks from my house on his way to go pay my school tuition, of all things. And so our lives really kind of changed drastically. And at seven, when the man who's tucking you in at night, taking you to school, you find out that one day he's just gone, uh, there's, there's really no sort of normal way to react. And so... At that age, you know, I went from being, you know, the perfect kid in school. Uh, always, you know, at, at seven, you don't really get A's and B's, right? You get the checks and check That's pluses. Right. When we get all the checks and check pluses to ending up at the principal's office every day and really kind of struggling with that trauma. So it wasn't until years later where I really got to kind of think back to, one, what was going through my seven-year-old head? Mm. Um, and then, two, what made the difference so that even though I struggled a little bit academically and behaviorally right after my father's death, I still was able to come back, right? What, what charged that recovery um, in a healthy way? And so there were two things. Uh, one, it was having a safe space. Um, Regard, you know, irregardless of what happened, my mother was always there. And, you know, she was a teacher and a social worker, so she poured into me and invested in me and made me feel safe, right? Um, and then the second thing was really being able to feel that in the midst of the storm, I still had an opportunity to change an issue that affected my life most. And so years later, the same girl who lost her father in the streets of mm. Newark will end up doing mentoring to other kids in the city who went through certain, th who went through similar situations, would end up volunteering at different organizations because I knew that being a part of making my community better helped me uh, better understand and work through How what I went through. How did you figure that out? You know what, Steve? It, one, it didn't happen alone, right? When we talk about social change and we talk about particularly improving the lives of young people, none of it happens in a vacuum. And so my mother, my school communities, um, my incredible teachers, my church community, all these different uh, individuals and, and institutions even, right, yeah. that stepped in um, and helped me not only see my own greatness, but also catalyze that to give back to the city that gave so much to me. So you, how did the young girls who have been affected by violence in the city find you and she wins? So it's, it's through a few things. A lot of it ends up being with direct our direct relationships with schools and organizations in the city. So we have guidance counselors, teachers, educators, social workers who know about the work we do. And they recommend and refer young girls to our programs. We enroll them in our summer leadership program. And then what happens is that once you're in, she wins, you, you never really leave, right? We have, uh, our model really is focusing on capturing our girls through seventh and eighth grade in middle school and supporting them through high school. So that way there's this long-term engagement um, and really a resilience-based focus um, that allows our girls to not only have this sort of consistent cohort that they can kind of stick with year to year, but also that they can come back to and mm. mentor girls who are coming up after them. So what you guys just saw in the video were some of our high school scholars who started with us at, in, at 13 and 14 years old, right? Now in their junior years of high school, and they are actually mentoring, guiding, and helping facilitate service learning projects with the ninth and eighth graders. You know what's interesting at the Raspberry Awards for Making a Difference, there are so many other people being mm -hmm. recognized in yeah. different fields. What was it like for you to be around so many extraordinary leaders who are quote unquote making a difference? Yeah, so what I, what I told you at the, during our interview. We did an interview there as well, yeah, yeah. Was that our girls were actually there. We actually had six of our high school scholars that. there in the, the room. And so it was incredible, one for me, you know, as an educator, as a nonprofit leader, to be surrounded by so many other incredible. You were incredible. one of the people there. I was, I was. So just to have that intergenerational element, sure. right? It was really powerful to, to see so many other people who are committed to this work um, in that space and for us to kind of, you know, bring some, we were networking, we were saying, look, we should work together. I know you're in Trenton. You were schmoozing. Then, we were schmoozing. I mean, you gotta schmooze to do the work, right? <laughs> <laughs> you learned <laughs> and, uh, networking. You have to, but then also for our girls to see that, you know what, we can be here too. I tell them, in 10 years, five years, I wanna be coming to your Raspberry Award. 
I'm going to be in the audience as you get it because they are the change. You know, our girls give back more than 500 hours of service learning hours the every year. The girls, Steve, right? Hold on. The young women the girls. who have been affected terribly by violence, they give back. Absolutely. Why? Hasn't we, enough happened to them that they should just take devil's advocate, mm -hmm. you say? You know what's interesting? I, I strongly believe that people who are most affected by issues are those most equipped to help find their solutions. Like you. Like me. And what's, what's, here's what's interesting, too. Our girls, the majority of them have either lost a parent or sibling to violence, have been in a situation where they know someone, maybe in their school or in their community, who has been affected by violence. But then there's also this other contingent of our girls who don't necessarily share that story, but have this burning feeling that this is my city, this is my community, I love it, but I don't always feel safe here. What can I do to change it? And so what we do is empower all our girls, regardless of where they come from, their backgrounds and their stories, to see that these changes exist, but so do their solutions. Mm -hmm. And you're more than your pain, you're more than your trauma, right? You can work through through that and, and develop an opportunity for you to not only achieve your goals for yourself, but also realize the mm. goals and the vision you have for your city. So I'm curious about this. There's a mentorship piece mm -hmm. that I'm fascinated mm -hmm. by. You, do you teach mentoring? Yes. Do you teach mentorship? Yeah, so it's almost like a two-tiered approach, right? I teach mentorship to the girls as well as our community partners and our volunteers. And then they mentor the, the middle and high school girls underneath them. All right, so here's the tricky question. Mm -hmm. um, as a student of leadership, yeah. as a teacher of leadership, I'm yeah. curious. It sounds like a cliche question, but I'm looking at you thinking, are great leaders born mm. or made and taught to be this? I think it's a both end. Were you born to be a leader? Absolutely. But you didn't know it at seven years of age when this horrific thing happened to you. And I, you know, it's funny. I just was telling someone this just the other day. I was born and raised in Newark, right? I ended up graduating high school from a, a high school actually right outside of Newark and then college outside of Newark too. But when I tell you that there were people in my middle school, born and raised in Newark just like me, who were just as smart, equally as capable, but didn't always end up in the right situations, we're all born great, we're all born with talents, we're all born to be leaders, but mm -hmm. you have to have the, the you know, the, the water, the sun, all these other elements to nurture those seeds. That's right. And so I think it's a both thing. I think that we're all born with something unique to offer the world, but we also have to have this other space to cultivate it. And She Wins does that for our girls. And more importantly, Steve, they do that for themselves and they do that for the rest of their city. You're not just a great leader, you're a great communicator and Thank you. you're doing a great job. Thank you, I appreciate Proud it. Of you. Thanks, Steve. Norkers, right. Norkers unite, right? Brick City all day. All day. <laughs> uh, who else? All right, who's the most famous person? From the city, I don't mean like Sarah Vaughn back in the day. Right, I'm saying that. Who is it? Whitney Houston. It's Shaq. Oh, see? God, it's you Whitney miss Houston. Whitney. I'm what? sorry. I mean, Shaq, I'm too, sorry, but, but Sha like, Shaq, come too. on. I hear you. I apologize. I do Mary Tom. We can do this all day. Uh, founder, she wins. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank Good you, job. Steve. Check us out after this. <laughs> Hi, I'm Cecilia Zalkin. It costs much more to care for an infant than for an older child, and many New Jersey child care centers don't have the funding they need. Because of this, many children in New Jersey don't have their basic needs met. Right from the start, NJ is dedicated to supporting this vulnerable population, children from birth to age three. We know that the early years are the most critical, and we believe that every child deserves a bright beginning and a healthy future. NJM Insurance Company has been serving New Jersey policyholders for more than 100 years. But just who are NJM's policyholders? They're the men and women who teach our children, the public sector employees who maintain our infrastructure, the workers who craft our manufactured goods, and New Jersey's next generation of leaders, the people who make our state a great place to call home. NJM, we've got New Jersey covered. Think Tank with me, Steve Adubato, is brought to you by these public-spirited organizations. MD Advantage Insurance Company, NJM Insurance Group, Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, the Russell Berry Foundation, the Turrell Fund, supporting right from the start NJ, the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, 
Gibbons PC, Wells Fargo, and by Bedway Associates, Inc. Promotional support provided by Meadowlands Chamber and by NJ Biz. Transportation provided by Airbrook Limousine, serving the metropolitan New York, New Jersey area.